My name is uh, Soteris Raptis, and I work as a uh, shipping and aviation officer in transport and environment. And the focus, uh, my presentation will focus on the post Paris, post MRV, and post Paris developments in the IMO and the EU with regard to the greenhouse gas emissions from shipping. Let me first um, say a few words about my organization. Transport and Environment is a Brussels-based sustainable transport group, an umbrella organization of environmental NGOs uh, with uh, 49 members and support groups across Europe. The focus of our work is uh, to promote uh, sustainable transport the focus of our work is on air pollution and climate change, and the aim of our work is to tighten or introduce uh, CO2 standards and uh, emissions reduction targets. With regards, uh, as regards all transport modes, uh, aircraft, uh, shipping, cars, vans, and lorries. Uh, let me start my presentation uh, by pointing to the big news, the big event of the last year, the Paris Agreement, where uh, all, all the nations of the world, developed and developing countries, agreed on the need uh, that measures need to introduce to halt the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. They also committed uh, to aim to reach global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible and to undertake rapid reductions thereafter. This agreement covers all sectors of the economy. Shipping, having escaped an explicit reference in the Paris deal, uh, the fact remains that the emissions from shipping are the elephant in the room, in the climate room, and will jeopardize the efforts of other sectors of the economy, making it, making it all but impossible to keep global warming well below two degrees. And the fact is that emissions from international maritime transport have grown by 70% since 1990, and compared to country emissions, maritime transport ranks between Germany and Japan. And the third IMO greenhouse gas study found that the CO2 emissions will increase up to 250% by 2050. The 1.52 degrees limit agreed in Paris by all nations, developed and developing, will be impossible to meet unless the EU and the International Maritime Organization don't introduce measures to cut shipping emissions as soon as possible. And it's quite striking if you compare these two tables. It's quite striking the discrepancy between the range of expected increase in greenhouse emissions from shipping and the, ship, the steep cuts which are necessary to meet the global, uh, the global warming limit agreed in Paris by developed and developing countries. And uh, the failure in Paris uh, to reference, to explicitly uh, reference shipping, despite, despite the fact that shipping was in the draft Paris deal until the, last, the second and last week of the, of the negotiations, um, where uh, the text, the reference to shipping and aviation was dropped just a, a couple of days before the final conclusion of the agreement, the fact that shipping um, wasn't there and the potential introduction of uh, measures at EU level in the context of the new climate legislation of the EU, because now the EU is about to decide uh, its legislation to implement the new 2030 EU climate targets, uh, played a great role in incentivizing very interesting moves in the run-up to uh, IMO MEPC, which resumes its work um, very soon, in two, in two weeks in London. And here I will directly quote from uh, the International Chamber of Shipping uh, paper, ICS 
asserts that the message from the UNFCCC conference and the Paris Agreement is clear. All sectors of the global economy are now expected to determine how they will can reach peak CO2 emissions as soon as possible before eventually decarbonizing completely. The main body who, which represents the, shipping, the ship owners, the International Chamber of Shipping, said that the sector needs to decarbonize. And it's a remarkable shift from the position that shipping is part of the solution to the problem of climate change to recognizing that shipping needs to make its fair share in the global efforts to mitigate climate change. ICS also supported the development of an intended IMO determined contribution on CO2 reduction for the national shipping sector as a whole, taking account of the Paris Agreement. Another very interesting paper, which will be discussed in two weeks in London, is a joint submission by developed and developing countries, the Marshall Islands, France, Morocco, Germany, and the Solomon Islands, which supports the development of a concrete work plan to define international shipping's fair share in international efforts to limit the rise of global average temperature. We see very interesting developments in the IMO, and we, see, we have seen this remarkable shift of the shipping industry, but what we need to see now is a concrete work plan and the introduction of measures as soon as possible. In parallel, the EU, as I mentioned before, is revising the EU ETS directive. It's, a, it's a not a, a top secret that the Commission proposed it was in 2013 that uh, a discussion on a market-based measure and a reduction target would follow the adoption of the MRV. It's public and it's in the communication of the European Commission in 2013. Shipping is currently the only sector, uh, the only transport mode in Europe not contributing to the climate targets. And what we propose in the revision of the EU ETS is a port-based flag neutral system on the base of the emissions reported in the EU MRV. In principle, ship operators, shipping companies will be subject to the EU ETS rules, but at the same time, and this is an essential element of our proposal, ship operators will be able to opt out and contribute instead to a climate fund. What is also an essential element of this proposal is that part of the revenue, part of the revenue for this fund will finance innovation and R&D investments in the sector. To conclude and to keep it short, to have some time for the discussion, the real question is how to, to, to decarbonize the sector, not if, how. And I listened very carefully to uh, the presentations of other, of previous speakers about the need to electrify the sector. But how this will happen when there is no regulation in place, when there is no mandatory target in place, who will invest money in R&D? And if we want to draw some lessons from other sectors of the economy, from the car makers, the the breakthrough happened when the EU and other countries put in place meaningful regulation. And now we see uh, on, on the streets of our cities, electric cars. We need a lot of money if we're serious about, uh, uh, about investing in innovation. And I'm not an expert in, in new technologies, but I, I have heard many speakers to, to talk about electrification. Let's talk about it, how to make this happen. A recent study commissioned with uh, CE Delft um, found that the only global uh, measure in place, the EEDI, is not stimulating the uptake of new technologies or driving efficiency improvements. Since 2013, newly built ships subject to the EEDI have performed much the same as those ships not covered by the EEDI and recent efficiency gains are part of a recognized historical trend
for ship design efficiency to fluctuate according to economic cycles and fuel prices. All the EDI regulation may do is prevent a reversion to the worst designs of the past, but will not encourage the uptake of new technologies, and new technologies are key for the fight against climate change and for the competitiveness of the sector. That's why we need meaningful regulation in place. That's why we need an emissions reduction target to fight against climate change and at the same time to incentivize, to promote competitiveness in the sector. Thank you for your attention and happy to answer to any questions.